How's it going guys? So this is my first microbiology presentation for YouTube. This is not going to be a long meandering 45 minute presentation akin to what you would get at a school of medicine lecture. We are just going to hammer home the high yield points for your USMLE. Okay, just cut to the chase. What's going to get you points in your exam? Okay, so before we get started, allow me to be a quick asshole and tell you to subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. Hit the like button. Really appreciate it. Hit the bell if you want notifications. Find me on Instagram at melman underscore medical, M-E-H-L-M-A-N underscore medical. Link is down below. Find me on Telegram. Recently created a Telegram group and channel. Links are down below. Now, how about we start the fucking presentation here, which we have our gram positive cocci, the staphylococci are catalase positive, the streptococci are catalase negative. USMLE is not going to obsess over that, okay? This is merely a visual representation. It's an algorithm for you to help you retain the material. It's to my observation working with students that if there's ever an issue remembering if an organism is gram positive, gram negative, caucus, rod, it's because of, there is lack of a visual uh, understanding of the material, okay? So memorize this flow chart. We're just gonna keep moving through, as I said, it's not gonna be a 49 minute presentation. So when we talk about the staff, we have Staph aureus, which is coagulase positive, you just need to memorize that straight up, okay? Which means on blood agar, it can cause a clearing. And staph epidermidis, saprophyticus, collectively are known as coagulase negative staph, okay? So staph aureus, it's referred to as gram positive cocci in clusters. That's how you'll see it in questions sometimes. Once again, coagulase positive. And Classically, golden staph. If you get a question where there's a skin infection, they describe it as yellow. If you get a burn, this is especially high yield because people will memorize burns with bacterial infection as pseudomonas, but pseudomonas produces pyocyanin, a blue-green pigment, whereas staph is golden in color. So some students will erroneously, instantaneously choose pseudomonas, even if uh, it's yellow in color, Wrong fucking answer, okay? It's staph. So, staph is the most common cause of cellulitis and bullous and non bullous impetigo. All right, so, and I'll quickly contrast this with strep pyogenes, as I'll discuss more later, uh, which is which eclipses staph aureus for erysipelas. Now, cellulitis is inflammation of the dermis and hypodermis, okay? Erysipelas is inflammation slash infection of the dermis and uh, dermal lymphatics. So cellulitis is tends to be more pink in color. Erysipelas is a fiery red. I know I could show images, but we're cutting to the fucking chase, okay? So erysipelas will be a fiery red. It looks worse than cellulitis, but cellulitis is actually worse and deeper. Cellulitis, staph aureus, erysipelas, group A strep eclipses staph. Now, impetigo this is your school sores in children. Uh, bolus versus non bolus. There used to be uh, this distinction that bolus might uh, be staph aureus over group A strep, but non bolus is group A strep over staph aureus. Literature says staph aureus is, most predominant, is the predominant organism for both bolus and non bolus in Patigo. You're going to treat cellulitis uh, orally with ceflexin or dicloxacillin, okay? not doxycycline, okay? That's a long discussion, which we won't go down right now. But oral dicloxacillin, which is in the methicillin class, as well as uh, cephlex in a first-generation cephalosporin, and impetigo, we would treat it orally the same way. But USMLE, especially 2CK, loves topical mupirocin for treatment of impetigo, okay? And erysipelas, although strep pyogenes eclipses staph aureus, there's still a smaller chance that it can be staph. So we're going to want to use oral dicloxacillin or oral ceflexin, as I said, same as cellulitis. Just moving forward here. Okay, high yield cause of mastitis. So breastfeeding woman, red cracked, fissured nipple. Continue breastfeeding through the affected breast. I would say about four out of five questions for mastitis will be as I just described it. One out of five, more difficult on 2CK OBGYN, will be upper outer quadrant, non-fluctuant, non-fluctuant, red, warm, 
tender mass. That's mastitis, okay? Non-fluctuant. If they say fluctuant, it's an abscess. If they say non-fluctuant, mastitis. Students get it wrong because they say, wait, I thought it was supposed to be red cracked fissure nipple breastfeeding woman. It usually is, but it doesn't have to be, okay? This is for the sake of a harder question here, but it's on the OBGYN forms. And you're going to treat the same way, uh, oral dicloxacillin or oral ceflexin. It's safe for uh, a baby for breastfeeding, okay? Continue breastfeeding through the affected breast, as I mentioned. So staph aureus, classically IV drug users, acute endocarditis. Acute means that there is no history of previously damaged valves. There's no murmur. There's no mitral valve prolapse, okay? You just have usually a young, healthy patient became an IV drug user, has a new onset murmur plus fever. That's going to be staph aureus till proven otherwise, okay? Acute endocarditis. Subacute endocarditis is going to be someone who has a history of a cardiac abnormality, okay? Usually mitral valve prolapse, mid-systolic click. Strep viridens, following dental procedures, very textbook, okay? So dental procedure, history of mitral valve, prolapse, uh, or cardiac defect, and then you're going to get a new onset murmur plus fever. That's going to be strep viridens. USMLE will often write strep mutans or strep sanguinis, which fucks with some people because people will learn strep viridens, but they don't they don't realize that mutants and sanguinis is the same thing. Okay, so you should know uh, mutants and sanguinis as uh, equaling strep viridens. And also limit dextrins. Uh, carbohydrate production is why strep viridens is able to adhere to valve abnormalities. So staph aureus, uh, high yield cause of septic arthritis. If they give you no information in a question really and just give you just a blind septic arthritis, staph aureus is going to be your most common cause. You should be mindful of, let's say they give you a sexually active 22-year-old uh, footballer who doesn't use condoms, then they're going to want gonorrhea, okay? Gonococcal arthritis. Or if they give you a sickle cell patient, you should be thinking salmonella. Now, salmonella classically osteomyelitis doesn't typically cause septic arthritis, okay? But salmonella will be the organism that USMLE wants if they specifically tell you sickle cell, okay? And it's a gram-negative rod, salmonella, if they say gram-positive cocci in clusters in someone with sickle cell, obviously that's staph aureus, not salmonella, right? You still have to use your fucking head. So there's there's a lot we can talk about. As I said, I want to try to streamline things, though. Uh, strep pneumo, important cause of lobar pneumonia. So, for example, if you get a question where they say right lower lobe infiltrates, uh, dullness to percussion, fever 102, Strep pneumo is not listed, and you're like, wait, where is it? But they list staph aureus. Just know that that can be an answer, okay? It can cause lobar pneumonia. Staph aureus, also the answer post-influenza. So if they tell you someone just recovered from a viral infection, fever, chills, myalgias, myalgias equals influenza in USMLE, that's, uh, and then they, then they have a bacterial pneumonia following, that's going to be staph aureus, okay? That's what USMLE really likes. Staph aureus can cause superinfection on scabies, okay? So scabies, uh, sarcoptis scabii, okay? Um, linear burrows in the hands. But if they want to, if they ask for a bacterial superinfection, choose staph aureus as the most likely organism, especially if the patient's immunocompromised. We treat scabies with topical permethrin, okay? Eczema can become superinfected with bacteria such as staph aureus. I've seen it in a question as well as uh, herpes causing eczema herpeticum, completely unrelated, but you should know that. Herpes superimposed on eczema, actual herpes, okay? Eczema herpeticum, that's more of a 2CK detail, but also staph aureus. And also tinea pedis, there's a hard question on one of the 2CK IM uh, forms where they, they tell you there uh, is scaling uh, itchy feet uh, and that there's redness that tracks up to the ankle and the patient has lymphadenopathy and fever and they ask for the most likely uh, cause of the fever and the answer staph aureus trichophyton was the wrong answer okay so it's it's pretty rare for tinea pedis for fungal infections uh, to cause fever okay and lymphadenopathy 
Bacterial superinfection more likely, especially if it tracks up to the ankle. We're moving forward. The immunology for Staph aureus, super fucking high yield, okay? So you need to know toxic shock syndrome is going to be uh, cotton packing or tampons, okay? So if they say 16-year-old male, car accident, had uh, nose bleeding, cotton was inserted into the nose, and now has a blood pressure of 80 on 60, and they say the immunological receptor or, re receptor or receptors most likely bound in the situation, what are they? The answer is MHC2 and T cell receptor. So TSST toxin, TSST toxin uh, from Staph aureus causes toxic shock syndrome. It's a super antigen exotoxin. It bridges MHC2 and T cell receptor, okay? That don't confuse that with endotoxic shock from gram negatives. So endotoxin, in contrast, will bind to CD14 on macrophages, also known as toll-like receptor 4, and that will cause the cytokines to be released from the macrophages, okay? Whereas with the TSST toxin, as I just said, MHC2 and T cell receptor and the macrophage will release cytokines. Staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, quadruple S, that's going to be epidermolytic toxin, and that will be uh, neonates, traditionally, who have desquamation de and diffuse erythema, okay? And that toxin targets desmosomes and can cause positive Nikolsky signs similar to pemphigus vulgaris, the autoimmune condition. Food poisoning, uh, Staph aureus produces a heat-stable toxin and will cause vomiting within one to six hours, often from eating uh, meat, okay, that's been sitting at room temperature for many hours. Also, potato salad, mayonnaise, creams, uh, those are also common causes of food poisoning due to Staph aureus. And protein A, this is just a toxin you should be aware of that can cleave the FC region of IgG, okay? So Staph aureus, you will frequently see in many of the immunodeficiency questions on USMLE. So chronic granulomatous disease, NADPH oxidase deficiency, obviously are catalase positive organisms. So we can have more specific ones like serratia, E. coli, candida show up in CGD questions. But I'd say about half of questions, they'll just give you staph, okay? Leukocyte adhesion deficiency, they can give you staph. Job syndrome, okay? So staphylococcal cold abscesses. Uh, so just know that staph can show up somewhat non-specifically. Now I said catalase, or sorry, co coagulase negative staph refers to staph epidermidis saprophyticus. Staph epidermidis is novobiosin sensitive. Staph saprophyticus, novobiosin resistant. Staph epidermidis, normal flora, it can cause infections, uh, prosthetic valves, also prosthetic joints. It can cause biofilms or form biofilms over catheters. And staph saprophyticus can just simply cause UTIs. So now we go over to the, the strep, okay? Now, strep pyogenes, group A strep, strep agalactiae, group B strep, these are both hemolytic. Students frequently fuck this up where they think group A strep means alpha hemolytic and group B strep means beta hemolytic, okay? That's wrong. Group A strep and group B strep are both beta hemolytic strep, okay? Beta hemolytic means causes complete hemolysis on blood agar, a clear zone of hemolysis on blood agar. Whereas alpha hemolytic, which I'll talk about soon, is incomplete hemolysis on blood agar, a green zone of hemolysis on blood agar. And gamma hemolytic is no hemolysis on blood agar. So strep pyogenes, bacitracin sensitive, strep agalactiae, bacitracin resistant. These are antibiotics that can be used in the laboratory to help differentiate these organisms. Strep pyogenes, gram-positive cocci in chains, whereas Staph aureus was gram-positive cocci in clusters. Pyogenes, enterococci, okay, even viridins can be described as gram-positive cocci in chains. So as I talked about before, uh, when we have cellulitis and bullous and non-bullous in patigo, Staph aureus eclipses group A strep. However, for erysipelas, group A strep eclipses Staph aureus. Now, uh, strep pyogenes causes strep pharyngitis, sore throat, okay, which can lead to scarlet fever. This will present with a strawberry tongue and also a diffuse 
salmon pink rash. Treat with penicillin to prevent rheumatic fever, as I'm going to talk about here, which super high yield for US simile. It's a type 2 hypersensitivity uh, against the it, basically our immune system is going to create antibodies against the M protein of strep pyogenes. Those antibodies against M protein will cross react molecular mimicry against mitral valve antigens. It can be other valves. It's usually the mitral valve, okay? And this is going to cause mitral regurgitation acutely. And then later in life, when the valve uh, eventually scars over, this causes a mitral stenosis, okay? U.S. Simile really likes you to know that that's a type 2 hypersensitivity. And also Jones, okay, to remember it, J joints, so you can get arthralgias. O is supposed to be the shape of a heart, as in you have the myocarditis, pancarditis, and rheumatic heart disease affecting the mitral valve. N, subcutaneous nodules. E, erythema marginatum. S, Sydenham chorea, okay, abnormal movements due to uh, CNS uh, autoantibody, or sorry, yeah, antibody response. Post-treptococcal glomerulonephritis. So a type 3 hypersensitivity is when we have antigen-antibody complexes. So we are going to get deposition of AGAB complexes in the kidney, sub-epithelial deposits. And I say here that students confuse PSGN with IJ nephropathy. This is what you need to know. Sore throat plus red urine one to two weeks later, answer equals PSGN. Sore throat plus red urine one to two days later, answer equals IgA nephropathy, okay? PSGN, wrong fucking answer, all right? So IgA nephropathy is going to be a viral infection, a URTI, okay, upper respiratory tract infection, sometimes can be a GI infection, but they'll give you like a sniffles for two days followed by red urine, okay? Or a sore throat followed by red urine one to two days later. A lot we can talk about, I want to stay focused, but IgA nephropathy also associated with Penox, Shonley, and Purpura. And you should know for PSGN that you can get that secondary to skin infections. So they can say yellow crusties in Patigo on an eight-year-old's forearm or face, followed by red urine seven days later, and that's going to be PSGN, okay? Whereas rheumatic heart disease will follow only strep pharyngitis slash scarlet fever. So we talked about toxic shock syndrome with the cotton packing, tampons, and also uh, nasal packing. But you should know that uh, strep pyogenes can cause a toxic shock-like syndrome, okay, due to exotoxins A, B, and C. So this is what they're going to do on Yosemite. They're going to tell you there's cellulitis and, you're gonna be th and, and that there's shock. And you might be thinking, oh, like, you know, maybe that's like staph aureus. That's the most common cause of... Uh, cellulitis. Um, they didn't mention cotton packing, but you're thinking maybe toxic shock syndrome, but staph aureus won't be listed, okay? And they might tell you that uh, blood cultures grow gram-positive cocci and chains. So you know that that's going to be strep pyogenes, okay? Toxic shock-like syndrome. So this is a lengthier discussion uh, about PEDS real quick, but I'll just condense it. Uh, there's something called the center criteria where they love for family medicine uh, for you to be able to differentiate a bacterial versus a viral upper respiratory tract infection. So they want you to know uh, fever, tonsillar exudates, lymphadenopathy, uh, cervical usually, and absence of cough. Not cough, okay? Absence of cough. Those four variables uh, are more often associated with bacterial infection versus viral. If you have zero or one points, okay, zero or one of those, then it's most likely viral. You do supportive care only, warm saline gargle, or viscous lidocaine gargle will be the answer on the US Mili. If you have two or more of those points, you're going to do a rapid strep test first. If negative, you do a throat culture, not a sputum culture, throat culture, okay? And then you send the pen patient home on amoxicillin or penicillin because it's most likely strep pyogenes. And if the patient gets a rash, if they're young, you think allergy to beta-lactam. If they're a teenager or older, you think maybe EBV. Okay, EBV can cause a rash uh, when treated with amoxicillin. Okay, it's weird, but that's what happens. 
EBV is the only virus that will present like bacterial, okay? There's a lot we can talk about, but EBV will present with all four center criteria. That's why it's often misdiagnosed as bacterial, but if you get a rash when it's EBV, very high yield, okay? So another point you should know is pandas. This is really fucking weird. So if they tell you that uh, there is a kid who has a sore throat followed by uh, a, a tick, a motor tick, like a Tourette-like presentation, or new onset OCD, or new onset ADHD, that is going to be uh, pandas, okay? So pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with streptococcus. It's weird, once again, but you should at least be aware of it for USMLE. And they want you to know anti-streptolysin O titers might be suggestive of the diagnosis. Strep agalactiae, group B strep, so really important cause of neonatal sepsis, meningitis, pneumonia, okay? So it's a gram-positive coccus, of course. If they give you a neonate who has, a, who has meningitis, pneumonia, sepsis, and you're thinking group B strep, but they say in the question, lab report shows gram-positive rods, that's listeria, okay? That's another important cause of neonatal infections. Or if they say gram-negative rods, you want to think E. coli. So... Neonates, infections, gram-positive cocci, group B strep, gram-positive rods, listeria, gram-negative rods, E. coli, all right? Okay, so pregnant women screening real quick uh, in order to prevent uh, infection in the neonate. Uh, women will get a uh, rectovaginal swab at 36 weeks, and if positive, you're going to give ampicillin or penicillin uh, within four hours of parturition, okay? And... They want you to know that you do not give ampicillin or penicillin prophylaxis if there was merely a prior pregnancy where the woman tested positive for group B strep and that was it, okay? So mere colonization and prior pregnancy is not an automatic indication in the current pregnancy for giving group B strep prophylaxis. However, if there was prior meningitis, pneumonia, or sepsis in the neonate, early onset group B strep disease in a prior pregnancy, then that is an indication of current pregnancy for GBS prophylaxis, okay? But not mere colonization. If, if a woman has not had a GBS test performed in the current pregnancy, you only give a GBS prophylaxis intrapartum if, number one, she has maternal, fe so maternal fever 38 or greater. Uh, number two, uh, it's a premi pregnancy, uh, so uh, before 37 weeks. And if we have, or if we have rupture of membranes greater than 18 hours, okay? So strep pneuma versus strep viridens, alpha hemolytic, okay? Once again, green zone of hemolysis on blood agar. And strep pneuma optochin sensitive, uh, strep viridens optochin resistant. So strep pneuma, strep pneuma is often described as uh, gram positive diplococci. Don't confuse that with gram-negative diplococci, which is naysaria, gonorrhea, and meningitis. So as I mentioned before, it's the most common cause of lobar pneumonia. Staph aureus can be a, another important cause. Atypical pneumonia, in contrast, is most often bilateral, okay? So if the USMLE tells you fever 102, right lower lobe, consolidation, dullness, percussion, it's most likely strep pneumo, okay? If they tell you 23-year-old male, uh, fever 101, he's got bilateral interstitial infiltrates, chest x-ray shows diffuse bilateral interstitial markings, that's usually mycoplasma, okay? It can be viral, it can be legionella, it can be chlamydia, etc., but usually mycoplasma, all right, for the sake of choosing bacterial answers here. So, and one important exception I should mention, there's a 2CK question where they say, uh, right lower lobe consolidation, you're like, OMG, that sounds like strep pneumo, but they say there's interstitial markings, okay? And then strep pneumo is not listed as an answer choice, and the answer is mycoplasma. So how do we how, how do we reconcile? If they say bilateral interstitial infiltrates, answer mycoplasma. If they say right lower lobe consolidation, dullness, percussion, no other information, strep pneumo. If they say right lower lobe consolidation, dullness, percussion, with interstitial markings, the word interstitial wins over location, choose mycoplasma. You should also know mycoplasma can cause uh, cold uh, agglutinins, okay? So it can cause uh, antibodies against 
I, uh, against RBCs, IgM antibodies, resulting in a cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia, okay? So if they say pneumonia plus uh, positive Coombs test, cold agglutinins, that's also mycoplasma. So strep pneumo, uh, most common cause of otitis media, middle ear infection. Obviously, ot otitis externa, usually pseudomonas. Uh, strep pneumo can cause bacterial meningitis, okay? There's other causes, but they just want you to be aware of that. And strep pneumo, very important cause of sepsis and sickle cell, so slash asplenia. So when you lose your spleen, the spleen is 50% of the body's reservoir of macrophages, so strong phagocytic capacity, okay? So when we, you've probably heard before that if you lose your spleen, you have greater susceptibility to encapsulated organisms. The reason for that is because we remove encapsulated organisms via opsonization phagocytosis. So IgG and C3B are the immune system's two major opsonins. They will bind to uh, the encapsulate organism, and then the organism is cleared out by the macrophages in the spleen. So if you lose your spleen, greater susceptibility to encapsulate organisms. Strep pneumo, nasaria meningitis, Haemophilus influenza type B. Okay, you need vaccines against those three. So vaccination points real quick for 2CK is that you're going to get strep pneumo vaccine at two, four, six months of age. You also need it uh, after age 65. Okay, there's certain high risk groups, as I mentioned, sickle cell, asplenia, also cochlear implant. Uh, there are patients who will receive uh, strep pneumo vaccine, immunocompromised, but two, uh, most patients, two, four, six months, as well as age 65, okay? Uh, we're just going to move forward here. So as I mentioned before, strep viridens, mutant sanguinis, uh, causes subacute endocarditis, dental procedures, history of mitral valve prolapse as an example. Now, enterococci versus strep bovis. So these are gamma hemolytic. As I mentioned, this means no hemolysis on blood agar. Enterococci can grow in 6.5% NACL, strep bovis does not. Enterococci can, can rarely cause endocarditis in patients who've had genitourinary uh, manipulation or procedures, okay? Catheter insertions, a transurethral resection of the prostate, TERP. So new onset murmur plus fever in a dude with BPH who's had a catheter in for a couple days, you want to think enterococci is a possibility. Especially if they say gram-positive cocci in chains isolated from the blood. Because staph aureus would be gram-positive cocci in clusters. So we treat enterococci with ampicillin. For some reason, USMLE likes that. And if resistant, we go to vancomycin. Vancomycin-resistant enterococcus. It's an important nosocomial infection. As is MRSA, methicillin-resistance methicillin -resistant staph aureus. And or carbo CRE, carbapenem-resistant enterobacter. That's a long discussion, okay? As far as the mechanisms, etc. So, strep bovis can sometimes cause endocarditis uh, in relation to colon cancer. It's an overrated detail. I say it's overrated because students like fixate on that as though that's like a very juicy factoid. Uh, I mention it here, but it's overrated. Once again, our algorithm, you can, you know, pause the presentation. I just want you to commit this to memory, okay? Now we're just going to hop through a few questions here. I could have put 40 questions at the end of this presentation. We're just going to do a few, okay? So we have a 16-year-old kid. He's in a car accident, nose bleeding, cotton packing, used intranasally, blood pressure 80 on 60, fever of 103. The question's asking, which immunologic receptor or receptors is our bound? What's the answer? Obviously, you can pause the presentation as you wish, but I'm just going to uh, keep moving through. So this is going to be toxic shock syndrome. Answer is MHC2 and T cell receptor. So TSST is a super antigen. It's going to bridge MHC2 on the macrophage with the T cell receptor on the T cell. Macrophage will release cytokines, okay? TNF-alpha, low blood pressure, increased vascular permeability, IL-1 causes fever. Do not confuse this with endotoxin, which uh, binds CD14 a, a, AKA toll-like receptor 4 on macrophages. Our next question is 32-year-old male with cellulitis and sepsis, blood cultures grow, gram-positive cocci in chains, most likely organism. As we talk about, this is strep pathogenes, okay, causing toxic shock-like syndrome, okay? So exotoxins A, B, and C, uh, very important, all right? 
28 year old woman. She's got a, a left breast upper outer quadrant, red, tender, warm, non-fluctuant mass, febrile 101. What's the most likely organism diagnosis treatment? This is most likely to be staph aureus. And the diagnosis is mastitis, not abscess, all right? We said abscess is a fluctuant mass, okay? Not non-fluctuant, which instead would be mastitis. And the treatment is gonna be oral dicloxacillin or oral ceflexin. It's safe uh, if she's breastfeeding. Not every woman is going to have the red cracked fissured nipple, as I mentioned before. Next question, 40-year-old dude, history of a mid-systolic click, that's our mitral valve prolapse, undergoes a dental procedure, now has a two-on-six whole systolic murmur, that's a mitral regurgitation, fever of 103, what's the most likely organism? This is going to be on the US simile, strep sanguinis or strep mutans, okay, strep mitis, strep viridens, okay? So this is subacute endocarditis. As we said, uh, the organism can produce a limit dextrin. It's a carbohydrate that allows it to adhere to valves. Next question. 40-year-old dude had recent catheterization hospital following a TERP. That's really fucking weird, actually, that I wrote 40. That that shouldn't, it should be more like 80, okay? You're not going to have fucking BPH where you need a TERP at age 40. But I'm not going to restart the whole fucking presentation right now, am I? So let's just say 80-year-old dude, he had a TERP. Now he's got... Grand positive cocci in chains with endocarditis. Uh, what's the most likely organism? Enterococci, right? Not hard. 25-year-old female, car accident. She has a splenectomy. Which, which three vaccines does she need and why? She's going to need strep pneumo vaccine as well as Neisseria meningitis and Haemophilus influenza, Haemophilus influenza type B, okay? And this is because she has susceptibility to encapsulated organisms. We said that the spleen contains 50% of the body's reservoir of macrophages. We clear encapsulate organisms via opsonization phagocytosis. C3B and IgG will bind to the encapsulate organism, goes to the spleen, macrophages clear them out, and we lose that ability. 12-year-old dude, sore throat, arthralgias, murmur. Uh, the Q asks, the process responsible for this condition is most similar to which other condition? This kid has rheumatic heart disease, okay, rheumatic fever. It's a type 2 hypersensitivity, so we look at our answers. Choice A, wrong fucking answer. That's type 1 hypersensitivity, anaphylaxis. We have an antigen of some sort. Uh, B antigen, like from a bee sting, peanut allergy, uh, will bind to IgE on the surface of mast cells, basophils, cause cross-linking of two IgEs, uh, degranulation from the mast cell, basophil, release histamine, anaphylaxis. That's type 1 hypersensitivity, wrong fucking answer. Choice B, Arthas reaction, also the wrong answer. That's type 3 hypersensitivity. That's going to be a uh, an injection site rash slash reaction. It's due to immune complexes. If you get, let's say, let's use COVID vaccine as an example, okay? So you get a COVID vaccine, you instantly get a rash that blows up in that area. That's a type 1 hypersensitivity, okay? It's, uh, in contrast, Arthas reaction takes three to five days minimum, all right? Due to immune complexes. That is Arthas reaction. Serum sickness would be a polyarthritis classically, uh, following three to five days following an injection, but localized is going to be Arthas reaction. A lot we can talk about. Graves disease, choice C, correct answer, because Graves disease is a type 2 hypersensitivity. hypersensitivity. We have uh, TSI, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin. It is an antibody that binds to the TSH receptor on the thyroid gland, activates it, causes hyperthyroidism, okay? So type 2 hypersensitivity is when you have an antibody targeting your own tissues, cells, receptors. Choice D, PPD skin test, wrong fucking answer. That's a type 4 hypersensitivity. It's T-cell mediated. So that's it for this presentation, okay? Uh, I think I, was, I said I was going to make a short presentation. It didn't work out that way. Uh, but I'm going to make more content. You know the deal. So if you like my stuff, subscribe to my channel. And I appreciate your time. That's it.